Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the organizers, to the organizers for inviting me here. And today I'm going to talk about applied deep learning. So who am I? I'm working as a data scientist in Berlin. I love machine learning. I'm a Kaggle junkie. And uh, my research interests are automatic machine learning, and I like handling text data a lot. And of course, I like big data. So uh, before we start with applied deep learning, we all want to know what is deep learning, right? So deep learning for me, and I think for most of you, is now a, a buzzword. So if you want a job as a data scientist, you must put deep learning in your resume. You're going to get selected for an interview. To me, deep learning is neural networks, all kinds of neural networks. Not shallow, but yeah, larger neural networks. And deep learning helps us to remove manual feature extraction steps. So when you're dealing with images, just imagine 10 years back, when you were dealing with images, you were using features like SIFT features or SURF features. So you don't need them anymore, because deep learning takes care of that. And many people might think it's a black box. Oh. We are not going to use neural networks. It's a black box. It's not. We'll see. So uh, history is always good, right? We must learn how deep learning uh, machines ha have evolved, how continents have evolved. So in 1989, we used to have something like this with the convolutional uh, layers and subsampling, then again convolution, something like this. And then we had something. Uh, in 2012, we had max pooling, which improved image net accuracy a lot. Uh, but we are humans. We always want something more. So we need to go deeper in neural networks. And then Google came up with this Google Net, which doesn't even fit on my screen, with a lot of inception layers, a lot of convolutional soft max pooling layers. And uh, since 2012 to 2016, there have been hundreds of papers discussing neural network techniques. So we'll, we'll go one by one, OK? And then you'll be like this, a bored cat. If I start talking about all the deep learning techniques for the last four years. So let's start with something interesting. What can deep learning do? We all know. like. Images, of course, it can classify images like in different categories, butterfly, dog, volleyball. People love classification between dogs and cats. And something RCNNs can classify different parts of an image. And it's very fast. And also, like, is it a muffin or is it a dog? It's difficult for humans, right? Don't eat the dog. Or maybe something like this. Maybe a pug or bread, loaf of bread. So deep learning can also be used in natural language processing with text data, sentiment analysis. There's been a lot of research in that field. And also for speech processing. So if you're using Siri and coming up with stupid jokes, so it's machine learning and deep learning. It's everywhere. Deep learning these days is everywhere. So the question is, how, how can I implement my own deep nets? So at the end of the talk, I, I think most of if, if you haven't implemented your own deep nets yet, then you will be able to do so. Yeah, so you can implement them on your own. So to implement them on your own, you have, if you know what kind of deep network you're, you're planning to implement you, have to decompose it into smaller parts. And then you implement the layers one by one, use Tiano or something, and then you start the training. <laughs> but there is something more. It's called fine tuning. So you can save yourself some time, and you can fine tune a pre-trained network. So for fine tuning, for mo mo most of the times, maybe you need to convert the data. So that's one of the steps. The next step is you need a network definition. So how does your network look like? Do you want to fine tune AlexNet, GoogleNet, VGG? And you need to define a solver that's also net. So I'm, I'm telling you all this because I'm, I'm going to talk about CAFE, developed by Berkeley Vision, and Keras, which is a Python library. 
So first, I'll start with Cafe. So how many of you have used Cafe? How many of you know about Cafe? Oh, great. So Cafe has, uh, why, why should we use Cafe? It, it's very fast. It's open source. It's modular. And if you don't know coding, it's expression based. So even if you don't know coding, you can implement your networks in Cafe very, very easily. And it's developed by a community, which is the best part. So you always have something new implemented in Cafe. So for Cafe, you need to convert your data. So Cafe uses LMDB, it's kind of database for images. Uh, if you have a lot of images, if you want to train faster, then you need to convert your data first. You need to define a network, which is a prototext file. I'll come, I'll come to that. And a solver, as I said earlier, which is also a prototext. And then you train the network with or without the weight, pre-trained weight. So prototext, it's, it's actually very, very simple. So this is one of the solvers here. And you define where you store the net, which is network.prototext or train dot prototext. So here, train val dot prototext, it accesses that. And then you have the number of test iterations after how many intervals you want to uh, test your network on the validation set. Uh, that's the test interval. And then display is one. So after every epoch, you, you get the results. You can define average loss, learning rate, what kind of learning rate policy you're using. Uh, then other parameters like gamma and momentum. And uh, snapshot prefixes where you want to store your model. So after every 100 iterations or 1,000 iterations, you want to store it somewhere. So you can give a location there. So, And uh, the best part of Cafe is it can run on a GPU or a CPU. So you just need to change it to CPU if you don't have a GPU. It's going to be slow. And then we come to the train.prototext. So in train.prototext, you have to define a network name. So here it's Linux, so that's why, Linux. Then you have to define the layer name, what kind of input you're using. So here's data input, and then the shape of the input. And then you can just carry on with writing the layers. So convolutional layer, and the bottom layer is data, so data comes to convolutional layer. And then you have the number of outputs associated with it, kernel size, stride, uh, what kind of uh, weight and bias initial initialization you want. And then sim in a similar way, you have pooling layers. So here I'm using, here it's using max pooling and kernel size is two, two strides. And after that, you can, you can actually keep on adding as many layers and pooling layers or whatever layers you want. And uh, in the end, you have something like uh, inner product layer, which is a dense layer, so, and with a number of, uh, with 10, 10 output layers. So in this case, I think it's, uh, it was training on MNIST data. So uh, 10 output layers, uh, 10 outputs. And then softmax, because you want probabilities so um, training a net using Cafe is very, very complicated. It requires a lot of coding. So that's it, actually. <laughs> so you install Cafe, you, have, uh, you ask it to train, and then you define where your solver is, and it will start training. And then you wait and see awesome results. Yeah, but. Somebody might say, yeah, fine tuning. OK, yeah, I don't want to write my network from scratch. So what's fine tuning? So in fine tuning, so Google has developed uh, Google Net, and th there's been a lot of research going on. And they publish their uh, what kind of uh, neural nets or convolutional neural nets they are using. And you can just get the weights, and you can fine tune those weights t for your data. So. Here I'm going to talk about how to fine-tune using Google Net, or 
like this is one of the use cases uh, that you you will see. So why Google Google Net? Because it has Google in its name, and Google is always awesome. It won the ILS VRC challenge, which is image challenge, and it's very complicated. So always go for complicated stuff. You will learn a lot. And Cafe has something called a model zoo. So there you can uh, download all these pre-trained networks and their weights, and then you can play with it, including Google Net. And you can get, get it on the GitHub of Cafe. So <laughs> next thing is one of the use cases. So this was actually a challenge. So I said, like, I like taking part in machine learning challenges. So distinguishing between Honeybee and a Bumblebee. So the training data set had somewhere around 4,000 images and 1,000 images for test set. So it's a very small data set. And 79% seven, positive and 21% negative samples. And the evaluation metric was area under the rock curve. So can anybody distinguish between honeybee and bumblebee? It's very difficult for me. I just hate bees. They hate me too. But yeah, it's very, it's tougher than distinguishing between a dog and a cat. Why? Let's see. So I started with a very simple model. Not so simple at all. Uh, so with three convolutional layers, three pooling layers, dropouts, two hidden layers with 2,000 nodes each and two outputs because it's only honeybee or bumblebee. And it, it was something like this. So it, the loss here is binary cross entropy, log loss, and the number of epochs, uh, okay, the, the here it's showing on little 50, I trained it for 100 epochs, but the error was not going down. And error of more than 0.4 is very high if you have a binary classification. So what should I do? I thought, okay, let's try fine-tuning Google. So for fine-tuning, you have to create training and test files. So since the data set is very small, the training and test files are going to be text files. I'll show you. Get the prototypes from Model Zoo, of course, where all the network definitions and solvers are there. Modify them according to your need. First run it as it is. If you don't see any improvement in your previous networks, compared to your previous networks, then fine tune. Then modify it, modify the parameters, and then run the cafe solver, which is again very complicated. So the training file looks something like this. So you have all the images and the labels separated by a space. And it's very easy to do that. So if you have a folder with a lot of images, you can just write a simple Python script to do that. So here I'm taking 10% uh, validation samples. You should always separate. And that's it, actually. Uh, the next thing is, after downloading uh, Google and Prototext files, you, of course, want to change it. So. I modified it to use image data. It's very small. I'm using text files for images. And I changed the batch size. So here it was using LMDB. I'm not using LMDB anymore. So I need to define the batch size, height, and width. And then I changed, uh, yeah. So uh, for if you want to test, you have test, test file similar to the train file. And so uh, here I'm not showing all the things that I changed. You can find that on my GitHub. And then I change the, like, the dropout ratio. So if, you, if you're changing a layer, you need to change the layer name. So from loss three slash classifier, it becomes loss x or whatever you want it to be. And of course, the number of outputs. So from 1,000 output to two outputs, because we have only two classes. And similarly, you need some changes in the solver. So one of the changes is like, you need to define where your training prototext is now. If you want to change the number of test iterations or test interval, you can do that too. I made display equal to one because I always want to monitor what's happening. 
and increase the average loss and decrease the learning rate a bit. And I kept the uh, rest of the parameters as it is. Some more changes were like gamma. I changed gamma, I changed the weight decay. And yeah, where do you want to store it? So it's, it's very simple, it's very easy. And that's it. So now you have modified the prototypes and now you, have, you want to see how it performs on your data set. And yeah, very difficult task. So you, you train it and you have to, so only the extra parameter here is the weights. So th this model you downloaded from Cafe GitHub and you just need to supply the weights because you want to modify the weights. So, okay, we fine tune. Now we want to know, okay, did it really help? Okay, and some, somebody might say Google that, yeah, it has all the classes you want. It doesn't have these. So um, this is, these are the TSNE projections of the data initialized with random weights. So we can see, like, we cannot separate out green and blue, honeybee or bumblebee. And uh, when I used Google Net as it is, I got something like this. So you can see, like, here is a small cluster forming. There are some clusters here, but still it's not separable. And this is the fine-tuned result. So you can see, like, what kind of accuracy you will get here. I got an AUC of 0 0.997. And um, to see how Google Net performs, so you have nine inception la layers and you can extract output from each one of them. You can do it using Cafe and Python. It's very easy or, and the code is available. And you see something like this. So with the red, red line is random, blue is pre-trained and then fine-tuned. So you can see, like, even with the small layers, the accuracy is pretty high. It's more than 80, but it keeps on increasing. So it's achieving somewhere around 95% accuracy, the pre-trained weights and random weights doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, so I've already discussed this. So why fine-tune? Because it is faster. If you want to train your neural network for several days and invest all your time, like weeks or days or months, it's better if you use a pre-trained network, if that can solve your task. It is better most of the times because there are researchers from all over the world who have invested so much time in that. And why reinvent the wheel? If somebody is offering you something, just take it and use it. And now um, the question comes like, how, how do we train a deep net in Python? So for Python also, it's very simple. For Python, I'm using Keras. So I'll talk about Keras. And actually, you can use Cafe too. It has a Python interface. You can use TensorFlow, Tiano, Lasagna, Keras, which is my favorite. You can use Neon by Nirvana Systems and lots more. If you really want to look into the deep learning landscape, it looks something like this. This is from this month. No, from June. So you can see like top libraries by GitHub Forks are TensorFlow, Cafe, and Keras. So after this, um, the second use case that I'm going to talk about is classification of search queries. So the place where I work, I'm uh, doing classification of a lot of search queries. And for that, I'm using neural networks, deep neural networks. So for search queries, um, I won't go into a lot of details. Queries can be classified into three different categories, navigational. So if you want, if you know where you want to go, like if you search for Walmart, then of course you want to go to the Walmart website or Amazon, then you want to go to Amazon website. And then you have transactional queries. So if you want to buy something, like let's say if you want to buy iPhone 6s, so it becomes a transactional query. Or if you want to book a hotel in Bangalore. And then you have informational queries. So who is the president of the United States? Or 
something like this, or if you just search for Bangalore or Kolkata. And the transactional queries can be further divided into four different classes. Awareness, evaluation, decision, and retention. So in awareness phase, customer is making himself aware of uh, the product. Then evaluation, he's evaluating, he's checking out the reviews or something, and then he's trying to make a decision when he's planning to buy. That's the decision phase. And retention is like, I have a broken iPhone screen. So yeah, that's retention. Um, so I came up with this idea of representing queries as images. So all the search queries can be represented as images. So this is the image of David Veer, the query. Uh, how is this image formed if you know about virtual vector embeddings? So when you search for David Veer on Google, you can extract all the title words and then create these word to vec vectors for each one of them. You can stack them together and it will give you an abstract image. Similarly for apple juice or search query Irish, you have these images. But what happens now? I don't see much difference between Guild Wars, a search query, which is a game, or apple juice. So it becomes something like this. You can be anything. So that image can be anything, but we can tackle it. So there are two different kinds of machine learning models that you can use. One is convolutional neural networks. You can, like, you can use the images directly or use the random crops from images. So you take the whole image and put it into a convolutional neural net and then see how it performs. Or you can do something really cool like this. You can extract random crops. I won't tell you how you, how you can combine it, because I'm also still researching on it. But one very simple way would be averaging. And then you can train a convolutional neural network on it. And uh, implementing neural networks with Keras, it's, it's very simple. So here, I'm implementing a multi-layer perceptron. So it's a sequential network you define the model a sequential model. Then you keep on adding layers if you want dense layer, and then add dropouts, then the number of classes you have. And uh, then it uses categorical cross entropy. So here you have a number of classes. Categorical cross entropy is multi-class log loss and an optimizer. And then you just fit the model. So X is your data, YC is your labels, number of epochs, and that's it. It's so simple. And similarly, you can uh, design a convolutional neural net. So you just add convolutional layers instead of dense layers, and then proceed the same way. You just keep on adding layers, as many layers as you want. And in the end, yeah, you have to flatten. And then if you want softmax or sigmoid, depend on, depending on your task. So as a result, uh, a very fast framework for classifying search queries was implemented. So it's very simple. The only thing you need to take up care of uh, is a lot of data. So how will you classify 800, how will you train on 800 million search queries? But with neural networks, you can just do online training. You can update the weights. So the model improves every day, these kind of models, and they outperform traditional methods. And yeah, of course, the paper is improved. And if you want to know more about it, then you can go to PyData Berlin website and where I gave this talk, and uh, you can see the full talk because it's like 40 minutes. Um, so we have approached like problems like, OK, classifying images or classifying search queries. Search queries converted to images, so it's basically images. But what happens when, when any kind of data comes to you? Like when I say any ML problem, it's mostly tabular data, the data that you see every day in most of the tasks. So I came up with this framework last year, which is pretty simple, not very complicated. So you have a data. So here, the pink lines represent the most common path that is followed. And blue lines are if you have different types of data, like categorical or text data. So of course, you split the data first, and then you have an evaluator function where you send the validation set, and then if you have numerical data, then you just don't do anything, and 
go to the model selection and hyperparameter selection. But if you have categorical variables, then you either convert it to labels or binarize them. And uh, similarly, if you have text data, then you, you can use some kind of text transformers. I like TF-IDF and uh, some kind of decomposition like SVD if it's required. And um, yeah, then this framework in the end, it gives you uh, the best model with uh, best hyperparameters. So this is one of the papers and you can read more about this like in detail if you want to. And uh, similarly this year, um, now since everybody is talking about neural networks, we want to know how to optimize neural networks. So this year I came up with a similar framework which is simpler than the previous one. It looks something like this, very similar to that. So here you can see like now I no, no, no longer need like uh, different kinds of decomposition methods. So if I have, if I have a data set, I split it into validation and training, and then I identify the type of features and stack the features. One of the very important steps of training neural networks is normalization of the features. So you can either do z-scoring or you can do log scaling. It depends on how different kinds of, different kinds of uh, feature normalization techniques you have used and implemented. So you can put all of them in the feature normalizer. And then you have a network architecture selector. So which is very simple, very basic. Like 20 years back when neural networks came into existence, we talked about how to design neural networks. So it uses the same, same kind of met kinds of methods. And then in the end, of course, you have the neural networks with best, I won't say best value, okay, best validation score. It might not be the best model, but nobody cares about one to 2% increase if you're working in the industry. So uh, yeah, and selecting a neural network architecture. So how the, so all these frameworks, uh, unfortunately they are not open source yet, but I'm, I'm working on that and maybe in a couple of months they'll be open source and everybody will be able to use them. So selecting a neural network architecture, it's pretty simple. Um, well, these are my tips, so this is how I, I go. So you can use, always use SGD or Atom Optimizer. Atom Optimizer converges fast, so you can train a number of uh, different models and see the performance. Always start low with a single layer, 100, 500 neurons. Use batch normalization, which is very effective, and uh, ReLU, rectify linear units, then of course, a dropout because you don't want your network to overfit. And then you observe the validation score. And if it doesn't work, you are not happy about it, or if your boss is not happy about it, then you <laughs> add new layers and increase like from 1,200 to 1,500 neurons, a very high dropout, 40 to 50 percent. And even then, if, the, if everything fails, if uh, your evaluation metric is saying very bad, it's a very bad score, then go for a very, very big network. Of course, first buy good hardware, and then go for a very big network. So 8,000 to 10,000 neurons, very high dropout, 60 to 80 percent, and if it doesn't work, then go for a random forest. <laughs> so, since I'm talking about uh, automatic machine learning, how, how can a framework select the best models? Uh, I'll also talk about a little bit about the AutoML challenge. So there was this AutoML challenge lasted for one and a half years. So with a tweakathon phase, final phase, AutoML phase, where your models are run on new data sets and a number of phases. So the framework that I showed you, how to select a neural network architecture or how to, how to approach any kind of machine learning problem, I used these frameworks for this challenge and it performed really well. So 
these are the results of the final one. So final one was a CPU phase and uh, final four was also a CPU phase. So I participated on only two phases of the competition. After the first one, I kind of forgot about it. So uh, in final four, the framework performs very well and got like third position. And this is the GPU phase. If you look at the architectures of neural network that I have built, it's very, very simple. And the other, other people built really complicated networks and uh, they could not win the competition. So, but, and, and it's similar to the industries. So don't invest a lot of time in, if, if you're not working in research, don't invest a lot of time in optimizing neural networks. One to 2% increase won't make your boss happy if you invest one month for it. So this was the GPU result. And what do we have now? So we, we have a partially automated framework. I mean, I say it's partially automated because it's right now works on only tabular data. You can have a lot of different types of data sets. So this system gives very comparable results and sometimes it's beating um, automated systems like Hyperopt. Um, and yeah, how, how this framework for neural networks or for uh, the other framework, how, how they were de designed was like, when you deal with hundreds of data sets, you know what kind of machine learning models will work, what kind of neural network can you design. So knowledge from some kind of knowledge from past data. And of course we have a future in this because right now I'm working on auto-tuning of convolutional neural nets, which I think should be big. And um, this was also like uh, discussed in very much detail in PyData Paris, if uh, like 20, 20, 30 minutes of talk. So you can read, you can see that and you can then, you can separate out different parts of the framework and see how the whole framework is designed. And it's all in Python. So, Final words for, for this talk, I don't think deep learning is magic or a black box. It gives you feature importances. It's, yeah, you have to explore a lot of things if, when designing deep nets for specific data sets. And yeah, so as I said, one to two percent improvement, I don't think that matters in industries. And thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Uh, in your experience, is there an architecture that's best fit for uh, temporal models? Temporal models? Yeah. No, it doesn't work. OK, thanks. Uh, I had a question on converting uh, uh, text to images. <laughs> What do you mean by temporal nature of text? Okay, okay, sequence to sequence learning, right? So, no, I'm not using sequence to sequence learning. No. So, no. you you can convert, you can convert, so like here, well, let me get back to that. So here you can, so how I'm combining these, so uh, you have a search query, and then you have the top results for that search query. And all the, to all the results have a title. So these titles are converted to virtual representations and stacked together. That's it. And if, if, you if you just want to train on the search queries, then you can use virtual embeddings for each of the word in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the query, and then you can train a LSTM. So I was wondering if uh, if there is some way of uh, like grid search based uh, pipeline method which we have in scikit-learn. Uh, do you have something like in uh, in cafe or uh, 
uh, is there a way to do something uh, similar brute force uh, parameter optimization here? Uh, well, I, I don't use grid search and I'm, I'm not sure if Cafe has one, maybe it does. I'm not sure about it. Uh, most of the hyperparameter tuning that I'm doing is it comes from experience. So um, you know which parameters to tune and which parameters to leave. And grid search is very slow. I would prefer using something like uh, Bayesian optimization. Can you please suggest us for some ways for evaluating uh, trained models? Like one is TSNE you alre already told. Something, uh, can you please uh, suggest us with some ways for uh, evaluating the trained models? One is TSNE, when you have no, like more number of classes, like more than thousands. So TSNE is not for evaluation, it's just a representation, so you can see um, this is on uh, the tra uh, on validation set so you can see like yeah it separates it's nice if uh, if you if you want to evaluate your model of course you split your data in training and validation train your network on training set and then see what's the error on validation so i i prefer that way so uh Hi. <coughs> so I wanted to uh, see the, the types of problems that you've attacked are fairly well crop image problems or the uh, text-based problem which do not include sequencing or the temporal uh, sort of nature of the data. Uh, I was wondering if there were any uh, pre-processing steps that you would suggest so that, uh, and you, you got very good results. What I'm trying to see is, uh, are there any pre-processing uh, steps that you would suggest so that you can uh, com uh, convert the, the type of data, more complex images, uh, different kinds of uh, text data into uh, uh, a, a type of data where um, you can get good results using the uh, techniques that you have. So like pre-processing steps for images or text? Both. Both, okay. Yeah, you can, y uh, it depends what your subject is when you're talking about images and you're classifying different objects. So if you're classifying a bottle and if it's in front of laptop and okay, a lot of other things, then you need to like uh, center it or sometimes you, you can do some kind of rotations. Uh, but most of the time, mm, I'm not doing these steps. You really can't apply it in batch, right? So for example, uh, if a bottle is in front of a laptop, not all of your data will be bottles in front of laptops. Mm -hmm. uh, they will all have different sorts of rotational issues. Uh, yeah. uh, so if, if it is not images, in terms of text, whether it's temporal text or natural languages, mm -hmm. or <coughs> you, you did mention search uh, queries, um, but, but if it is you know, a different type of uh, document that you are analyzing, mm -hmm. are there, uh, or, I or if you have um, handled uh, text other than the ones that you've mentioned here, uh, did you end up using uh, certain preprocessing steps that can be applied on a batch m uh, uh, way over over the uh, data that you analyze? In batch, so, but preprocessing text is fast enough, right? Uh, why do you need batches for it? So, uh, so what uh, what you can do if, if you uh, if you want to clean text, so you can remove stop words from it. Uh, yeah, like these kind of things. And when you're dealing with search, then uh, you have to take care of HTML tags. Yeah, so these kind of things. And then uh, TFIDF, most of the time it captures everything. Hello. Hi. Uh, so uh, you just said that, you know, one to it's not worth fighting for one to two percent accuracy. and you know, probably time is more important, but. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get you. Sorry. Uh, you, you just said that it's not worth fighting for one to two percent accuracy. Uh, it's, it's basically a trade-off between time and accuracy, right? Uh, you know, in some industries it does matter, like the lending industry, uh, or like when you're trading like a huge portfolio of money, mm. uh, one to two percent saves you like millions, which matter. So what is your, you know, 
what is your strategy there? Because the only way now is you get into a research mode um, or you know, you get into a mode where you have to come up with your own algorithms or maybe like a fine tuning algorithm which is not applied. So what is your, you know, what is your strategy there? Yeah, so first I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask what kind of industry. So if, okay, if it's, uh, if we have to deal with a lot of data every second, it's like millions of uh, rows, millions of samples every second, then I won't even use deep neural networks. They are too slow. And I'll go for something like logistic regression, which is simple and easy. So, and if, if you don't need any kind of online, uh, online evaluation, so, or you don't want to test your model online, if it can run offline and uh, if it takes several days or several hours, if it's okay, then, and if one to 2% accuracy is equal to a million dollars, then yeah, of course do it. Now, uh, my question was, do you have a framework for that? Like, do you have a framework in mind? Because, I mean, research is, is you know, what academics do is, is kind of not documented very well. Like, you documented the ML framework very well, right? So, do you have, like, a research framework when you're fighting for, like, one, two percent accuracy? So, the framework, the framework that I described, right? It, um, it gives you a direction. So it gives you very basic, simple models that you can use. And uh, the thing is, the space, the parameter search space is very limited. And it comes from knowledge of uh, different other data sets. So uh, if it has seen some similar data sets previously and it has used parameters in a certain range, then it will use them. And it will give you a model and then you can, then you can do it manually. So it won't, it won't give you the best model in the world, but it will give you just a direction. It will give you a good model, that's it. And it, uh, it yeah, then one to two percent accuracy, uh, it's not dealt with by the framework. Uh, we have two more questions on the. Uh. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the lovely talk, big fan. Thank you. Uh, anyways, uh, like you said, uh, with a network, if there is a batch normalization, uh, is it necessary to have dropouts as well? Batch normalization is a normalization technique, and dropouts, you use it for regularization. So, uh, yes, you should. Okay. Uh, actually, I was referring to the original paper. They said that uh, dropouts is a regularization technique which can also be uh, implemented in... Uh, implicit way by batch normalization that's why i asked thanks is it yeah. okay uh, might be i don't know about it yeah thanks okay last question hi uh, uh it might be kind of a stupid question but uh going back to your fine tuning example say i have a binary classification for images uh, exactly what you did so what you're suggesting is go with the AlexNet or something which is very uh, well trained and just replace the last softmax layer and just train your network on that. Is that the technique that you followed roughly? Is that? Is that the technique you followed roughly that just uh, remove the last layer and put in uh, a layer with uh, random weights and just train it again? Is that what your Bumblebee and those two type of bees training? No, was? I changed a lot of things in that. So no, but uh, ideally, you f that could just be a starting point, right? Just yeah, change, yeah. change. Uh, so, yeah, if you just want, if, if you don't want to fine tune, if you just want to see how this network performs, then yeah, just remove the last layer, and modify it from 1,000 classes to two or three or whatever number of classes you have. And you might need to change uh, to softmax or sigmoid, depending on your problem. Okay, and how slow is, th is this as compared to your orig original model that you had? Because original models, they, uh, there wasn't can a lot of... Uh, can we take this question offline? Uh, Abhishek will be available for sure. the Birds of Feather session at 3.15. So if you have more questions, you can, you can talk to him then. Uh, thanks, Abhishek. Thank you very much.